The video was prepared especially for the AK Cassian channel. Greetings, friends. In amateur radio practice, the task of regulating the power of a DC load often arises, for example, the brightness of an LED strip or the rotation speed of a fan. And in most cases, a PWM signal is used for this, which is applied to the key element through which the load is powered. In today's video, I want to tell you about five interesting and useful circuits that will allow you to generate this very PWM signal. Nowadays, for such tasks, the classic choice is to use a chip. Like the 555 timer or a simple 8-pin microcontroller. And there is a lot of information about these implementations on the internet. I decided not to repeat myself, and therefore, there will be no programming in this video. And 555 timers. But I'm sure it will be interesting. So don't forget to support me with a like if you enjoy the video. And the first circuit is a generator. A PWM signal generator based on a multivibrator, which allows you to assemble a PWM signal source literally from scrap. You will need three transistors, five resistors, two capacitors, and a potentiometer. Let's take a look at the classic multivibrator circuit. Transistors VT1 and VT2 alternately turn on, generating a square wave signal. The duration of the voltage presence TU0 and the zero presence TU1 depends on the discharge rate of capacitors C1 and C2, and consequently, the values of resistors R2 and R3. If we place a potentiometer at this point, we can smoothly adjust the duty cycle of the PWM signal, that is, the ratio of the signal period to the time tau0. Why won't the frequency change? Because by decreasing R2, we will increase R3 by the same amount. And consequently, the sum of tau0 and tau1 will remain constant with some margin of error. Let's briefly go over the calculation of the values. First, we look for two identical NPN transistors. For example, I happen to find two N5551S, an A292 package. We find the datasheet for it and note down the value of the maximum dissipated power. 625 milliwatts, maximum collector current 600 milliamperes, and the current gain or amplification factor of 160. And of course, let's decide on the supply voltage, for example, 5V. Next, we determine the collector current using the following formula, and we get the value of the collector resistances. Now let's calculate the value of the base resistors. Their value should be within the following range from R minimum to R maximum. Minimum resistors rounded up. We install R2 and R3 in place, and choose the potentiometer so that the base resistance along with the potentiometer is around the maximum value. Now we calculate the value of the capacitance. Let's say we want to achieve a PWM frequency of 30 kHz. Therefore, the capacitance should be set as follows. Rounding down will increase the frequency. Rounding up will decrease it. Now we move on to calculating the resistor for the switch. It should be chosen to be twice the collector resistor. Next, we obtain the base current value, after which we need to determine the load current. Let's say I want to control a fan with a current of 150 milliamperes. Therefore, the collector current should be 10 times the base current. So you can use almost any PNP transistor as a switch. If a higher load current is needed, you can use a Darlington pair or powerful MOSFET transistors. And now we move on to the second circuit. This is also a simple circuit, built on logic elements. A generator is assembled on the basis of three elements, with a period approximately equal to RC. Diodes separate the charging and discharging process of the capacitor, which causes the time TU0 and TU1 to change. Just like in the previous circuit, the sum remains unchanged to some approximation. There is a switch at the output. The maximum output current of the chip depends on the series used. It usually amounts to a few milliamps. Some chips made with CMOS technology can be powered by increased supply voltage. This allows for avoiding additional components and simplifying the circuit. We will assemble based on such a circuit, a regulator for an LED strip, at the end of the video. To test the functionality of such simple circuits, it's convenient to use breadboards. Now let's move on to more unusual PWM signal generation circuits. And the third circuit will be one built on the K174GF1 chip. 
This chip is a line scan generator powered by 12 volts. It is very sensitive to overloads, overheating, and static discharge. However, by assembling a simple board according to the following scheme, you can achieve a fairly stable PWM signal. The load resistance should be more than 500 ohms. Personal advice. If you find such a chip and decide to replicate the circuit, use a socket and keep the chips wrapped in foil. Until the last moment. The fourth circuit will be based on the K1561AG1 chip, or its foreign equivalent, the CD4098. This chip is a dual monostable multivibrator made using CMOS technology. A monostable multivibrator is a device capable of generating a single pulse. The circuit includes two such monostable multivibrators. One triggers the second, after which the second triggers the first. And so it goes in a loop. On the internet, you can find the following regulator circuit using this chip. In it, the time tau 0 is fixed, while tau 1 is variable. This results in the fact that the duty cycle of the PWM signal changes due to the frequency change. And you start to hear this PWM signal. I don't know about others, but personally this doesn't suit me. I propose the following circuit. The minimum resistance value according to the datasheet is 5 comb. I used 10 comb and a 500 ohm potentiometer. I connected the resistor. Just like in the first circuit of the generator based on a multivibrator. As a result, the resistance is changed proportionally, and so does the output frequency. The plus minus remains unchanged, but the duty cycle of the pulses changes. With the values of the elements indicated in the circuit, the frequency was approximately 30 kHz. And finally, the fifth circuit, in which I wanted to add digital elements. For variety. Structurally, it consists of a reference frequency generator, a tunable counter, and a D flip flop. I've already told you about all these elements. Let's figure out the circuit. The reference frequency generator is built on the basis of three knot elements. By varying the capacitance, you can achieve the desired PWM frequency. The greater the capacitance, the lower the frequency. From the fourth knot element, which acts as a buffer, a signal of a certain frequency goes to the K155 counter. And E8. Let's take a look at its truth table. This counter has six inputs that set the division ratio of the clock frequency from 1 to 64. That is, let's say, a logical 1 is applied to input E1, and a logical 0 to all other inputs E. Then, for 64 clock cycles of the signal at input C, only two cycles will appear at output Q. The frequency will be divided by 32. At the same time, when the counter counts to the last value, a signal will appear at the carry output. We take the signal from the Q output and the carry output and feed it to a D flip-flop using asynchronous inputs for setting and resetting. Now the signal from the carry output will set the flip-flop and the signal from the Q output will reset it. A rotary switch can be placed on the E inputs of the counter. By switching the logic 1, according to the truth table, you can achieve a PWM signal duty cycle from 50 to almost 100%. A similar circuit can be assembled in many different ways. You can use a counter and a decoder, or whatever you have on hand. If you are interested in this topic and would like to see a digital PWM controller with single button control, without using microcontrollers and programming, then write about it in the comments to this video. Well, let's assemble a circuit on a comp inverter to control the LED backlighting in my shelf with cassette drawers. The maximum current I think is about 1A, no more. I don't really see the point in making a printed circuit. We're assembling everything with point-to-point -point wiring. As the key component, I decided to use an n-channel MOSFET CAP50N06, a few of which I acquired, somehow, while disassembling an old uninterruptible power supply. I combined all the remaining elements not in the microchip to increase the load capacity. The first test revealed a low frequency of the PWM signal, which caused the strip to strobe both on camera and to the naked eye, which isn't cool. So, I changed the capacitor, reducing it by about 1000 times and achieved approximately 100 kHz, 
which is not visible to the naked eye or on camera. All that's left is to add some hot glue and assemble everything into the case, then secure it in the desired location. Another Soviet microchip has been put to use, instead of being dissolved in acid for gold. I hope this fact is as pleasing to you as it is to me. Friends, I hope the video was useful to you. I sincerely thank you for watching the video to the end. In the description of the video, you will find all the useful links. Subscribe to the channel. This was Andre with you. Goodbye.